Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Business Law Weekly. This is season two and the fourth episode in, um, and it's our learning initiative, our growth initiative as uh, the SBL. Uh, we have a very interesting conversation today, um, and I will just quickly hand over to our chair person, Dr. Adewe Adefulu, to give us opening remarks. Um, it's an honor to have you, sir. Welcome. Uh, please go ahead and give the opening remarks before we go into the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uyemi. And um, it's truly a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank uh, the NFIU who are partnering with us to bring uh, this discussion uh, today on the money laundering or anti-money laundering reforms uh, in Nigeria and the role of lawyers. Obviously, there's been a lot of discussion around what lawyers should be, uh, what uh, restrictions can be imposed on lawyers and uh, the nature of the relationship between lawyers and, and clients. Uh, and the issue of uh, anti-money laundering in the, in the recent past is actually something that has uh, come to the fore with the great listing of Nigeria. I think it was in February 2023. So it has significant implications. Uh, the great listing obviously has significant implications on the Nigerian economy and the way in which we can easily trade and, and do business with uh, other jurisdictions. And uh, this discussion uh, will touch on you know what those reforms are and what rules lawyers uh, can play in implementing insofar as it does not breach our fundamental uh, our fundamental relationships and, and those uh, laws uh, by which we abide. So I'm looking forward to the discussion and I'm obviously looking forward to me chaperoning and moderating this discourse. So all the best to us today, and um, uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, Adefulu. If you're just joining us, this is Business Law Weekly, um, and this is season two, the fourth episode. Today, we're going to be talking about Nigeria's anti-money laundering reforms and the legal profession. Um, we have two very skilled individuals from the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit. And this is at the Associate Director, Legal and Sanctions, Mr. Felix Obiamalu. Um, you're welcome, sir. Thank you so much for taking time out um, to spend, father. yes. Excellent. And we also have Ms. Gina Wood, um, who is a senior lead at Giaba. Now, Giaba is uh, a response platform by ECOWAS, which is um, intergovernment, an intergovernment action body that's driving AML reforms as well in West Africa. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, Ms. Wood. Thank you very much, Oyeyemi. Good Excellent. afternoon, everyone. I'm very Excellent. pleased to be with you, and I hope we'll be able to um, trash out what we, we have come here to do. Thank you very much. Excellent. Like Dr. Defulu said, um, this um, space is subject to a lot of controversy, especially with regards to lawyers. And so it's important for us to establish what the objectives are today. Um, one of the key objectives that we have um, is to get our lawyers knowledgeable about the role and the function of other AML bodies and actors apart from the routine ones that we know, the EFCC, the ICPC, uh, the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit is a salient 
state actor, and in many times we're conversing about AML reform and we do not mention their role or even reference their uh, contributions in this regard. So we will be getting enlightenment on the role. Earlier on in the year, the MBA had stated at a retreat with the NFIU, um, the position of lawyers as regulated, um, designated non-financial um, institutions, businesses, and professions. And there's ample um, you know, jurisprudence around it, including uh, a leading court decision. So that space is not within our remit today. We're not going to be debating controversies. It's simply a learning um, objective on the role that the NFIU, GIABA, and similar authorities play in AML reforms. In 2022, we had significant legislative activity, yet in 2023, we were greylisted. And so we would have to walk through what needs to be done over time. And we're hopeful that at the end of the day, this objective will be done. I will quickly get off the soapbox and hand over to Miss Gina Wood, who would be walking us through um, the major reforms led by the Financial Action Task Force, um, the Global Authority on AML Reforms and Regulation. And um, when she's done, we would have Mr. Obiamalu also come up um, and discuss major um, interventions by the NFIU and what um, the landscape for AML regulation is currently in Nigeria and going forward. We would have a Q&A after the sessions are done and hopefully um, we would have enough time to get through most of the questions from the floor. So you can begin to put any questions that you have in the Q&A box so that they can be taken into consideration as soon as it's time for the Q&A session. Thank you everyone for joining. We look forward to a very rich discussion this afternoon. Over to you, Ms. Wood. Um, thank you very much, Amy. Um, good afternoon, everyone, once again. I'm very happy to um, address you this afternoon. In fact, the issue of um, lawyers compliance or lawyers being subjected to AML CFT requirements has actually um, sparked a lot of debate all over the world. It is not only in Nigeria. Currently, we are seeing a lot of compliance coming up and we hope um, at the end of the day, we'll be able to assist you to also um, move along the lines that will make um, lawyers feel comfortable in implementing their necessary AML CFT measures, not to only protect themselves, but also to improve the economy of Nigeria. As you mentioned, Nigeria has been gray listed and um, despite the reforms and all that, one of the areas that is really receiving a lot of attention is the issue of uh, implementation of um, robust preventive measures by financial institutions and uh, designated non-financial um, businesses and professions. Um, when you look at the mutual evaluation report, for instance, of Nigeria, you can see that um, immediate outcome three was rated as uh, moderate and one of the areas that impacted um, the country's in, um, effectiveness with um, supervision is the fact that um, lawyers who are rated as high risk are not effectively or are not supervised for AML CFT compliance. I believe um, Felix will um, touch on the reforms that Nigeria has made um, in the area of um, AML CFT compliance by um, lawyers. I will take you briefly through what um, the FATF requires um, lawyers to do in terms of um, AML CFT. Um, maybe my screen will go off. By way of introduction, um, I'll say that um, lawyers are considered, uh, they are considered as um, professional, um, they are considered as gatekeepers because they have a lot of information 
that um, actually helps the government to improve its economic um, outlook and all that. At the same time, um, um, at a point, the FATF recommendations um, focused mainly on financial institutions. But somewhere along the line in 2001, um, due to the risk or due to the involvement of certain sectors being in um, criminal investigations and all that, the FATF also in 2001 identified um, what they call the designated non-financial businesses and professions, that is in, uh, which includes um, lawyers who are considered as being vulnerable to um, being abused for purposes of money laundering and the financing of terrorism. So in this case, um, the lawyers as gatekeepers are seen as um, those who assist with transactions involving the movement of money, both uh, domestically and also internationally. So in this case, um, this makes uh, what the lawyers vulnerable to um, money laundering and the financing of terrorism due to um, the services they provide to um, um, the services they provide to their clients that is involving certain transactions. Um, these include um, the creation of legal persons and arrangements. I think um, Nigeria has discussed a lot regarding um, uh, beneficial ownership information and all that being used to um, hide the proceeds of crime. And also um, due to um, the legal professional um, confidentiality and the rest, some um, criminal elements try to um, take advantage of the legal profession to hide their criminal activities. So based on the, the FATF's analysis, the FATF decided on certain areas that they believe um, lawyers can be helpful to the improvement of the AML CFT system and also to protect themselves from being abused for purposes of money laundering and the financing of terrorism. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole presentation. I'll, I'll send that to you afterwards, but I would like to say that um, when it comes to lawyers, we'll have to look at the specific FATF recommendations that apply to them, and which we will find in um, the FATF recommendations or the methodology, that is um, recommendation 20, recommendations 22, 23, and we also have recommendations 28, 34, and also um, 35. When you look at uh, recommendation 22, for instance, um, the lawyers are required to conduct what we call um, customer due diligence. Um, they are also supposed to keep, maintain records. They are also supposed to um, file suspicious transaction reports when they detect or they have suspicion that funds involved in the transaction could be um, could originate or could have originated from um, any of the 21 predicate offenses depending on the uh, law of the country some just limited to the 21. Um, categories of predicate offenses identified by the FATF. So in this case, we, um, we can report what we believe to be a suspicion. And also um, based on the reporting, um, the FATF recommendations also protect lawyers who uh, file suspicious transaction reports in good faith. Um, lawyers are also supposed to have their internal control mechanisms or internal control procedures, processes, and the rest that enables them to um, identify suspicious transactions, enable them to provide training for their, um, their staff. And um, here I'd mention that um, the FATF recommendations apply to lawyers who are operating in their private firms and not lawyers who work in let's say government institutions or private um, uh, institutions. So we are talking about 
those who work in firms, whether as a group or individually. So um, the lawyers are also supposed to put in place the mechanisms that is this should be in addition to the CDD requirements that um, the lawyers are supposed to implement. They are supposed to um, have appropriate mechanisms in place that enables them to identify what we call the politically exposed persons, that is um, prominent individuals who have been entrusted with uh, public offices, such that these people are seen to pose some sort of risk because of the, um, how do you call it, their connection to government, the ability to also uh, divert government funds and all that. So we are supposed to also, um, I, uh, when uh, high risk countries are identified either by the FATF or by um, the country itself, lawyers are supposed to apply what we call the enhanced due diligence measures or what we call the countermeasures, depending on what this is required for. For instance, if um, you identify a country, uh, for instance, doing business with a person in Iraq, um, sorry, in Iran or the DPRK, you're supposed to apply enhanced due diligence measures um, to businesses or transactions that you perform on behalf of the client. High risk um, countries can also be countries that have been identified by the FATF. Um, that is in case um, the countries that go through what we call the uh, fatal gray list, if the country is listed on the um, blacklist, the, that country can be subjected to countermeasures. And currently, what's happening is, um, for instance, um, even though Nigeria is just on the gray list, which may not require um, applying the kind of countermeasures and all that, certain um, countries may um, choose to apply more enhanced due diligence measures to protect their economies against what they believe to be um, criminal proceeds emanating from Nigeria. Um, the lawyers are also supposed to um, also um, implement or uh, they should also um, be subjected to what we call the requirements regarding um, new technologies. That is to uh, conduct the necessary risk assessment and all that to ensure that if they are coming out with any product or they are coming out with any um, delivery system and all that, that those systems are not used, um, are not abused for purposes of money laundering and the financing of terrorism. And also we can also talk about application to what we call the financing of the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Um, finally, we also have what we call the reliance on third parties. Um, for instance, the laws of Nigeria allows or the FATF recommendations require um, countries that allow their um, financial institutions and designated non-financial businesses and professions to, who, to rely on third parties to um, conduct certain aspects of the customer due diligence measures. Uh, in this case, where um, the lawyers re rely on the third parties, the third party can be another DNFDP or can be a financial institution that can provide adequate information regarding the, um, the, um, the identity of the customer or the client and the beneficial owner. But in this case where the um, lawyer relies on that third party, um, the lawyer, the ultimate responsibility to um, undertake those aspects of um, customer due diligence still rests with the lawyer. So in this case, if there are problems or there are uh, gaps in the identification process, the third party will not be held liable. It is the person who relies on the third party who will be um, held liable. So um, I also mentioned the issue of um, the requirements for um, 
the lawyers that is others where we have to do with the role of the bar association. When you look at the FATF requirements, for instance, the areas where the bar association or the um, lawyers can submit suspicious transaction reports to the bar association. So this will depend on the arrangement or the laws that the country has in place. So in this is where I would encourage the bar association of Nigeria to work hand in, in hand with um, the um, the NFIU and um, the Ministry of Justice and all that to see how best um, lawyer the bar association can play its role as a self-regulatory body. I think the um, AMLs, the money, the SCUMO regulations um, also provide for situations where the self-regulatory body, that is the bar association, will have to work with uh, SCUMO to also undertake some sort of monitoring to ensure that um, lawyers are actually implementing their AML CFT obligations. Um, this also comes into play, brings into play the issuance of guidelines to um, lawyers to be able to understand their AML CFT rule, what they should do by way of customer due diligence, what they should do by way of identification of um, suspicious transactions. These guidelines should be able to um, provide um, red flags that the lawyers will be able to um, pick on to know that they are being their services are being abused for purposes of money laundering. So this calls for a lot of collaboration between the um, bar association and lawyers and also the NFIU and those leading the implementation of AML CFT measures to um, come up with robust guidelines which can be frequently updated to ensure that lawyers are comfortable when implementing the required AML CFT measures. And also um, the Bar Association um, being a self-regulatory body should also have powers to apply sanctions to um, lawyers who do not implement or do not effectively implement AML CFT measures. Um, I'd like to say that when it comes to the FATF standards, it is not a blanket um, requirement that the lawyer should apply the um, FATF standards to everything that they are doing. When you look at re recommendation, recommendation 21 um, and recommendations 21 and 23 actually spelled out, spell out situations where lawyers are supposed to implement the necessary AML CFT measures. That is to implement customer due diligence measures, record keeping measures, identification of um, politically exposed persons and application of enhanced due diligence measures. You have um, new technologies, reliance on third parties, having internal controls, how to deal with um, countries, uh, higher risk countries, reporting of suspicious transactions, and also um, protection against tipping off. So in this case, when you look at recommendation 22.1D, it um, indicates the um, situations or when the lawyers can um, apply those measures. For instance, it's um, when the lawyers are buying and selling real estate on behalf of their clients, or when they are managing um, um, clients' money or securities or other assets, when they manage uh, bank, um, bank account savings or securities on behalf of their clients, and then uh, when they organize contributions for the creation or operation of companies, and then you have also the creation, operation, and management of legal persons or arrangements and buying and selling of business entities. Um, this is what enables the lawyers to take what we call the risk-based approach uh, in ensuring compliance, because um, the understanding is that we are dealing with um, um, limited resources 
and uh, you have to ensure that where you put your money is where you actually where it will actually protect your business and also to protect you against any criminal prosecution. So in this case, um, we'll talk about um, lawyers in when they have to um, take this risk-based approach, they should be able to identify the money laundering and the terrorist financing risk that their firms face. That is not all money laundering and terrorist financing. Those that their firms face, and then you look at the customers, you look at the services, you look at the country where you operate, and then also you look at publicly available information. So when the lawyers um, are able to do that, they should also, um, this is where lawyers can actually um, feed their um, risk assessment into the national um, risk assessment. Because we have a lot of um, risk, uh, national risk assessment identifying or rating um, lawyers as being high risk um, entities. And we had a lot of debates where lawyers have disputed that they are not high risk. So if the lawyers are able to identify their risk, they're able to feed into the national risk assessment such that what actually is the risk in the firms is what is actually reported in the national risk assessment. So if the lawyers are able to identify their risk, they should be able to also uh, put in place appropriate measures that will enable them to mitigate and manage the money laundering and terrorist financing risk. If in the absence of a risk assessment, what will happen is available resources or scarce resources will be used in just um, implementing anything, anyhow. That is where in a situation where you can say that using a, a sledgehammer to kill a, a, a fly, would you say that that is an appropriate way of using your resources? If you know that you have a fly, then you don't need a sledgehammer to kill the fly. Maybe a repellent will do. So um, when you are able to also put in, the, uh, put in place the mitigating measures, you should also um, put in place your policies and procedures that will enable you to also um, con uh, continue or monitor the money laundering the terrorist financing risk to ensure that whenever there are changes, you are able to also uh, mitigate those risks. For instance, your lower risk of today can be your high risk of tomorrow. So ongoing monitoring will uh, enable you to be able to apply the appropriate measures as and when the risk increase or decrease. And as much as possible, we should also have, we should document the risk assessment, come up with your policies and strategies and all that, that um, we will also uh, update the strategies and policies on how to deal with the risk as and when they change or they arise. Um, I think um, basically I have touched on what the requirements of the FATF are for, that is in brief for um, lawyers. And I'll still emphasize that we should take the risk-based approach. And um, I'd say that when we look at, um, for instance, the AMLC uh, Money Laundering Prohibition Act and also the regulations, for instance, um, what seems to be lacking is also is to um, go according to the requirements in the FATF um, standards that is requiring lawyers to undertake CDD um, record keeping and all that based on the parameters that have been set in the um, recommendation 22.1D of the FATF standards. So the, the issue of having, um, please, just a, um, please, um, I'm having feedback. So um, we should um, rely on 22.1D and deal with, um, um, ensure that we take a risk-based approach to the implementation of the FATF standards so that we um, avoid what we call the unintended consequences 
of the implementation of the FATF standards. So um, by way of conclusion, I'd like to say that um, um, the FATF recommendations um, is um, consistent with what lawyers as guardians of justice and the rule of law um, who are subject to ethical obligations have always done, that is to avoid assisting criminals or facilitating criminal activity. Uh, so in this case, um, I will say that we should work together and then to ensure that um, Nigeria uh, moves to the level that it is expected to be. I would um, like to say that um, when it comes to the next round of mutual evaluations, FATF has decided to um, segregate um, the assessment of financial institutions from designated non-financial businesses and professions. So in this case, when we are not implementing the required um, um, FATF standard, what will happen is that um, the assessment, in the assessment of um, DNFBPs, um, it will be so glaring um, as to who um, seems to be the weakest point because almost all countries seem to rate um, the role of lawyers in preventing money laundering and terrorist financing as very high and for that matter. When um, lawyers are not implementing the required FATF standards, they are seen as the weak links or vulnerable um, weak links to the implementation of AML CFT uh, measures in the country. Sorry. Um, yeah. So um, I'd also say that um, the um, lawyers are not um, just left by themselves, not to um, without any protection. The FATF standards also provide uh, situations where um, the legal profession secrecy can apply so that um, lawyers are not uh, um, omnibus required to apply um, AML CFT measures in every situation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Miss um, Wood, for the presentation. Sorry um, for the feedback from. Oh, no, it's understood. Thank you so much. Um, it was not as uh, interrupting. So uh, we, we heard you loud and clear. Um, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. We know that uh, you have to um, move on to something very shortly, uh, but we would ask that you permit us to move on to the next presentation and reserve questions for you. Um, later on after we've run through the second presentation. I noticed that uh, the numbers of people in the room has nearly doubled. And so uh, just to bring those who just joined up to speed, um, this is Business Law Weekly. It's uh, a learning initiative um, for members of the SBL and the legal community at large. Um, uh, to enable our uh, uh, professional capacity. Um, what we're discussing today is anti-money laundering and the combating um, of the financing of terrorism reforms in Nigeria um, and how it affects the legal profession. Uh, there are a couple of terms that you may have heard, uh, FATAF, gray listing, I will quickly run to, through those two so that you can catch up. Uh, FATAF is the Financial Action Task Force, which is um, an intergovernment collaboration uh, to drive AML compliance globally. Um, and gray listing is uh, what has happened to Nigeria. It happened to us earlier on. Um, FATF has different lists. It's like a rating agency in essence. And so uh, based on compliance, countrywide compliance, um, it rates countries and puts them in certain categories. We um, were degraded to a gray list because our monitoring um, is considered deficient. Right, and that's the essence of this conversation. How we as lawyers can also collaborate um, 
to um, improve Nigeria's strategy for increased monitoring and so that we can get off the gray list um, because it does affect our reputation as um, an investment site. Uh, quickly, I will move on to Mr. Felix Obiamalu, who is the Associate Director, uh, Legal and Sanctions of the Nigeria Financial intelligence unit um, and he will be running us through general reforms and the role that the Nigerian financial intelligence unit plays um, in um, improving AML CFT compliance um, in Nigeria. Thank you so much Mr. Biamalu. Um, over to you. Uh, would request that um, the IT team, please put up the slides that Mr. Obiamalu has shared um, so that uh, it can aid the conversation. Um, Thank you so much. Can I pop out quickly and come back? Yes, please, ma'am. Yes. Thank you, Thank you for, me, for having me. And uh, good afternoon, participants. I will start by um, appreciating the Nigerian Bar Association, uh, led by its president, Mr. Yakubu Machal Essen, and especially in a very special way, the MBA section of business law, led by President Andoye and Defu, for making this possible. I also extend my appreciation, the appreciation of the unit, the NFIU, to the immediate past president of the bar, Mr. Uh, um, Olumide Abata who started this um, process, and also the chairman of the Anti-Corruption Committee of the Bar, uh, Professor Taru Ese, for their encouragement and support. Um, today, we are just continuing the conversation that are ongoing with respect to the role, involvement, and participation of lawyers in the MLCFT in Nigeria. And Mrs. Wood from Java has spoken eloquently and extensively on the role of lawyers. For lack of time, I will just speak to my paper. I won't um, bore you with some of the details there. And we are lawyers, we read, and we can read all afterwards. Next slide, please. Yeah, the my paper is segmented into introduction and brief overview of the AMS CFT legal framework, the role of the NFIU and AMS CFT in Nigeria, the relationship between the FIU and relevant authorities in Nigeria, as well as the NFIU's contribution to Nigeria's AMS CFT efforts and the challenges, as well as future outlook, future prospects and developments. Um, the, Growth of illicit economy propelled by the developments of the 20th century, as well as the tragic events of the 9-11 in U.S. triggered the uh, general and improved uh, awareness or interest in AMS CFT worldwide. And that also impacted Nigeria. Prior to that, the fights had been basically uh, uh, local and um, Regionalized. Next slide. The first AMS CFT, next slide. Please. The first AMS, um, <clears throat> AMS CFT laws in Nigeria was developed in 1995. It drew from the NDLA decree of 1989. The 1995 decree, which was centered basically, next slide, which was centered basically on the drug related money laundering, was further improved after the, in 2003, after the UN resolution 39 and 141, dealing with uh, um, illicit traffic in narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances. Next slide. These developments in our legislations continued until 2011, when we have the 2011 MLPA, MLPA 2011 that was further amended in 2012. The 2011 Act was repealed in 2022. 
the major international instruments upon which these laws or acts were hinged on are the UNTOC, that is the United Nations Convention Against Trans National Organized Crime, 2003, which Nigeria is a signatory. We also have the UNCAC. Um, I wish to state that in this um, sector, we make use of acronyms a lot. We have the UNCAC, which is the UN Convention Against Corruption. We also have the International Convention for the Suppression of the Financing of Terrorism and the African Union Convention on Preventing and Combating Corruption signed into law by the US Assembly, AU Assembly of Heads of State in July 20, 2003. Next slide. Then, we, then the FATF. The FATF is the global standard setters in MS safety worldwide. It's a non-governmental organization, but it has its standards and um, activities have several implications to countries worldwide. So it has, even though it's a non-governmental organization, it has acquired a governmental uh, status with respect to its standards and measures. As the IMF, the World Bank, and the United Nations all abide by its standards. Next slide. It is these conventions and standards that greatly influence the laws and the legislative regulatory reforms in countries, including Nigeria. So our MPA, our TPPA, and the POCA are all founded in the, these laws and standards. So, so the EFCC Establishment Act, as well as the ICPC and the NFIA. Now, in the course of this discussion, we have also been told are informed about the second round mutual evaluation report of Nigeria and the fact that Nigeria is presently under the FATF gray list. The gray list of Nigeria is, did not happen by chance. Chance It was um, as a result of Nigeria's not too good performance during the second round mutual evaluation report. And the import of our results from the mutual evaluation exercise is that our MS safety measures are weak. The weakness of the measures are a product of identified uh, deficiencies in our uh, uh, laws. Now, the mutual evaluation exercise is done in two folds. There's the technical aspect and the effectiveness aspect. The technical compliance deals with the laws and legislations of the country. When they, <clears throat> and they are, the, the laws are tested uh, um, alongside the 40 recommendations of the FATF, while the effectiveness is also tested along the 11 outcomes of the FATF. So uh, after the second round of evaluation, which was for 2019, but the report published in 2021, Nigeria did not perform so well. And Nigeria was given a... a a one-year post-observatory period with 84 recommended actions to see if we can show up our MSCFT framework. After the post-observation period, Nigeria was deemed not to have done uh, taking significant, significant steps to remedy the situation. So in February 2023, Nigeria was placed on the gray list by the FATF. Next slide. Uh, it is to address the deficiencies identified in the uh, uh, mutual evaluation exercise that the Money Laundering Prohibition and Prevention Act of 2022 was enacted, repealing the 2011 enactment. The essence of the 2022 enactment is to bring the laws in tune with the FATF recommendations. Some of the salient provisions in the 2022 Act is the reduction of the period for filing of STRs to 24 hours, the establishment of SCUBO as a department of EFCC, the, and then the reporting of DNFDPs exclusively to SCUBO. SCUBO is now empowered as the regulator for the DNFDP sector. There's also a provision requiring the Attorney General to submit to the President the Money Laundry Strategy Report. 
incorporating input from all the relevant agencies and competent authorities. Also, the powers of the Minister of Trade and Investment to make regulations under the MLPPA. So they removed. And there is significantly the duty of disclosure for legal professionals and notaries in specific areas of practice. Now, the legal practitioners in specific areas of practice have now been obliged to make mandatory and statutory disclosures. The legal profession is also included in the DNLVP category. It is heartwarming to know that for the first time in the history of legal profession in Nigeria, MS safety guidelines and rules have been incorporated in the rules of professional conduct. Prior to now, the MBA and the body of ventures have always uh, demanded stick, uh, uh, strict uh, ethical uh, standards from Nigerian lawyers. However, yeah, it is not strictly on AML CFT, but in the 2023 rules of professional conduct for legal professionals, an AML CFT guideline was included. Next slide. Then the Terrorism Prevention Act was also amended or repealed. The 2013 Act was repealed by the 2022 Act, which is a result of the mutual evaluation report. And it provides some of the certain provisions of that law is also an express provision of terrorism and financing of terrorism. It establishes the Nigeria Sanctions Committee. Prior to the 2022 Act, the Nigeria Sanctions Committee exists as a product of the TPA regulation, but now it has been given statutory backing and it becomes a, a statutory body. The criminalization of the provision of funds for terror groups in and outside Nigeria. And also it defines and it extended the definition of acts of terrorism. Next slide. Also, the TPPA brought, 2022 brought in criminalization for proliferation financing, which was hitherto not existing in Nigeria. It makes for provision for the implementation of the United Nations Security Council resolutions relating to proliferation and freezing obligations with respect to peer. Established the Victim Trust Fund and criminalized the use without lawful authority of radioactive and nuclear materials. A lot of us will remember the dumping of radioactive materials in cocoa some years ago. Now, with the coming of the TPPA 2022, such actions are criminalized and not to be punished. Next slide. We also have the Process of Crime Recovery and Management Act 2022 which is part of the measures taken by Nigeria to strengthen its AMS safety framework. It, established, it provides for the establishment of process of crime management directors in all relevant organizations, and those relevant organizations were stated in the act. It also provided for non-conviction-based recovery of process of crime, that's for future, others, order to preserve property reasonably suspected to have been derived from unlawful acts and reflects instrumentality of unlawful activity. Disposal of property subject to preservation order. It makes provision for how properties that are subject to preservation order can be disposed, especially when they are uh, assets or properties that cannot um, uh, that cannot last, cannot survive the process. Then there's for future order on balance, official order on balance of probability, that's the standard. And the seizure and detention of cash in the process of being transported. You remember the, the cash that was found at the airport. Confiscated and forfeited properties accounts to be kept at the central bank. That is the recovery account at the central bank. Next slide. There are other frameworks developed in line with the laws, and that's the statutory um, regulations. 
We have the TFS regulation on terrorism financing, the regulation on implementation of targeted financial sanctions on proliferation financing. We also have the sector regulations by CBN, SEC, NICOM, and SCUMO. EFCC, that is SCUMO. Then the NFIU administrative sanctions regulations. Next slide. All these regulations are meant to strengthen the AMSCFT framework in Nigeria. Next slide. Upon the placement of Nigeria on the gray list, Nigeria is expected to implement 15 action plans so as to exit the program. And Nigeria has two years to implement, successfully implement these 15 action plans so as to exit the program. And um, failure to successfully do so potent serious consequences for Nigeria as it may lead to Nigeria being blacklisted. Um, and when, if Nigeria is blacklisted, Nigeria will have um, as colleagues and counterparts in the blacklist, DPRK, that's the North Korea, Iran, and Myanmar. This is a list Nigeria never wished, we never wish to be. So the, the, our ability, our, our determination to exit the gray list is dependent upon our successfully implementing the 15 action plans. And, and to, to do that, all relevant stakeholders, including the legal practitioners, are expected to come together, collaborate, and put in their best. And the role of Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit in the AMS CFT framework in Nigeria. You may recall that the NFI previously exists as a department of the EFCC. However, due to Nigeria's quest to comply with Recommendation 29 of the FATF, which calls for an independent and autonomous FIU. The NFIU Act of 2022, 2020, 2018 was enacted, creating the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit as it exists today, as the central body responsible for the receipt, request, analyze, and dissemination of financial intelligence reports to law enforcement agencies, security and intelligence agencies, as well as other competent authorities. Next slide. The functions and powers of the FIU as contained in the Act includes the powers to collect, analyze, and dissemination of financial intelligence. These financial intelligence are, uh, reports are made up of analysis of mandatory reports like the statutory, the STRs, which are statutory, the CTRs, the FTRs, and the SARs. These are reports rendered to the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit by the financial institutions and the DNLBPs. Prior to the 2022 MLPPA, both the DNLBPs and the financial institutions rendered these reports to the FIU. However, upon the enactment of the 2022 Act, the DNLBPs are now mandated to render the CTR reports to SCUMO. So it is only the STRs, that is the suspicious transaction reports that are to be rendered to the FIU by DNLBPs, which includes legal practitioners. They will also have the mandatory disclosures by financial institutions, that is the threshold disc disclosures, the CTRs, then the international transfer or transportation of funds, security and cash disclosures. NFIU or the FIU is also mandated to collaborate with both domestic and international agencies regulatory authorities, competent authorities, professional authorities with respect to combating MSCFT. Next slide. Today, the FIU is a member of several international bodies and organizations, which includes the Egmont Group, that's the Egmont Group of FIU, it comprises of all the FIUs in the, in the world. They also the FATF and GIABA, which is the regional FSRB for West Africa. The FIU does not only receive and analyze uh, financial reports, 
it also undertakes studies and researches into trends, typologies, and patterns, and then disseminates its findings by ways of guidelines, guidance notes, advice lists, executive alerts to relevant uh, supervisory authorities and competent authorities. The NFIU Act made NFIU, the Secretariat of the Interministerial Committee on Anti-Money Laundering and Countering the Financing of Terrorism in Nigeria. So NFIU is the Secretariat of the IMC. And by so, by so doing, it also coordinates the activities of the IMC. It also serves as the Secretariat of the Nigerian Sanctions Committee. The uh, Director C of the FIU next slide is also the National Correspondent of Java. All heads of FIUs are the, seen as the National Correspondents of Java in their respective countries. So they also coordinate the MS CFT activities in their countries. Next slide, please. Next slide. Under the FATF um, standards, there are four types of FIU. There is the administrative, the judicial, the law enforcement, and the hybrid. The hybrid is a mixture of one of the first three. Nigeria, in its wisdom, adopted the administrative approach. The implication of this is that NFIU, that is the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit, is an administrative FIU and thus does not investigate or prosecute. It is not strictly a law enforcement body, but not also a, a, a strictly a regulatory body. It's in between. It receives financial intelligence, financial reports, analyzes it, and disseminates financial intelligence reports to law enforcement. So as, as it is, the NFIU can be said to be a buffer between the financial and the law enforcement sectors. It receives the analysis, develops, and generates IRs and disseminates. So it aids the activities of the law enforcement agencies. It also aids the supervisory agencies by issuing advisories, guidelines, and guidance notes. The unit is autonomous, independent, and for institutional location is located within the Central Bank of Nigeria. Its core mandates include combating MS, CFT, CPF in Nigeria. Next slide, please. In 2022, the unit coordinated the National Inherent Risk Assessment of Nigeria. And also this year, it coordinated the residual risk assessment that was carried out. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. The FIU also facilitates international cooperation and information sharing as it uses the platform of the Egmont Group, the ESWU, which is an information exchange platform of all FIUs in the world to exchange information that aids investigation and inquiries. We also respond to requests from our foreign counterparts. It is interesting to note that the membership of the Edmund Group, Edmund Group is not automatic. For a country to be a member of the Edmund Group, it ought to be sponsored by two of the existing members of the Edmund Group. Presently, Nigeria is sponsoring three members from the West Africa to the Edmund Group, and they are Sierra Leone, Liberia, and the Gambia. At the Edmond Prenali of 29th Edmond Prenali of the Edmond Group, Nigeria in Latvia, Riga, Latvia, Nigeria won three awards. In this year's Edmond Group held in Abu Dhabi, Nigeria was also given a certificate of recognition for its contribution to the growth of the Edmond Group. And presently, Nigeria has an officer serving at the Edmond Secretary and also an officer as the vice chair of the 
information exchange working group of the Edmonds. We also have a member at the drafting, drafting table and review table of the MSCWG. That's the membership support and compliance working group of the Edmond group that is dealing with is, uh, redrafting the process and procedures of the Edmond group. Next slide. Presently, to Nigeria has officers in the Interpol, the present director of financial crime investigation in the Interpol headquarters is a staff of the FIU. We also have a staff at the AFRICO, as the African police. Next slide. Challenges of Nigeria's ML, CFT, and future outlook. We've talked about the coalition of Nigeria and the requirement for Nigeria to develop an exit uh, gray list within two years. Nigeria is making efforts to exit the gray list. And in so doing, it has come up with a lot of initiatives and approaches, which includes this conversation we're having this afternoon with respect to the role and impact of lawyers in the process. Next slide. We've talked also about the consequences of the gray listing. Apart from the reputational damage it does to the nation, it also affects the economy adversely. It affects, <clears throat> excuse me, it affects also the corresponding banking ability of Nigerian banks, as well as also increases our cost of borrowing. And God forbid, it, it, it will be worse if Nigeria is blacklisted. Presently, Nigeria is just a jurisdiction of consent to countries. So the countries view transactions coming from Nigeria as with uh, enhanced diligence. Next slide. Next slide. Yes. Mrs. Wood has talked extensively about the role of lawyers in reporting and the MF CFT in general. I wish to comment briefly on that. The RPC 2023, which is an improvement of previous uh, enactments on, for lawyers on MF CFT, has aptly captured the reporting, the STR reporting obligation of, for lawyers. And I, I just wish to state that what all that the FATF requires lawyers to do is enshrined basically in the RPC. It may not be, the RPC may not be in strict, in strict uh, compliance with the FATF standard, but it is enough for us to leverage upon and improve the system. First, it adopted the risk based approach to combating AMS CFT, which is in line with FATF expectations. Uh, it also makes it mandatory for legal practitioners to make STR disclosures in specific practice areas, which is in line with the uh, uh, FATF standard. However, I need to point out that the disclosures by legal pro practitioners to the NBA <coughs> is, does not replace the disclosure to FIU. What I'm saying in effect is that the disclosures, STR disclosures made to NBA by legal practitioner is that the, the NBA's role in the STR rendition is that of a post office. And, and the NBA does not have powers or discretion over those STRs. It is for MBA to remit the STR disclosed by legal practitioners to the FIU. MBA does not have powers to analyze it or to add or remove from the STRs rendered to it by the legal practitioner. It is strictly as a channel towards getting them across to the FIU. Next slide. The, the, also, on the issue of uh, CDD and enhanced CDD, Mrs. Wood has spoken extensively 
and admirably on those ones, the MBA, in partnership with the FIU and SCUMO, we develop, ought to develop a guidance on how to go about this, as she advised. I, having gone through the RPC 2023, even though the, there is a provision for lawyers to render SDRs to the FIU through the MBA, there is also a provision for lawyers to uh, conduct risk assessment and also enhance CDB. However, the, what amounts to, what transactions amounts to suspicious transactions are not expressly contained in the RPC. So these are things that ought to be developed via a guidance note to be put together by both SCUBA, NFIO, and the MBA. In conclusion, I wish to, I urge the Nigerian Bar Association to look at the implications of the gray listing for Nigeria and its um, adverse effect on not just the legal partitioner, partitioners, but on Nigeria as a whole. The, the, the interest should be on how best to protect the economy. When the economy is protect, protected and accelerated, the legal prof profession will benefit uh, immensely. I, I recommend that the MBA works closely with SCUMO to undertake a sector risk assessment for, legal, for the legal profession. This will help to, <coughs> excuse me, this will help us to know the risk profile of the, prof, the, the legal practitioners. There are differences in sizes of firms and locations. So this will help to aggregate this risk and know the way to concentrate resources and energy. I also recommend that there should be a, a joint committee of MBA, NFIU, and SCUBO, as is done in Canada, to serve as a platform for cooperation and collaboration between these three entities. It will help in fighting and combating AMA, TF, TF related the uh, issues in legal practice. It will help us to harmonize and accelerate the compliance of lawyers. I also recommend that a guidance, a reporting template and guidance should be issued jointly by the FIU, the SCUMO, and the MBA, so as to guide lawyers on what and how to report STRs. Finally, I will urge that this sort of conversation continues so that knowledge and capacity on AMS CFT will be built along amongst lawyers and also uh, enhance their capacity. Thank you very much, uh, MBL, SBL, and thank you, Oyeyemi, for having me. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Biamalu, for the very, very detailed presentation. Um, we are running out of time, <laughs> so, uh, and we have questions. I had questions for you, but I will prioritize the questions that we have in the Q&A box uh, quite quickly. If we could run through them in 30 seconds to one minute and combine what we can, it would be helpful. Interestingly, sir, many of the questions are for you. Um, so one of the questions says, can you please clarify why it is difficult to engage with the NFIU? Um, there appears to be difficulty in reaching hotlines and communication, um, emails, the challenges with communication in general. So maybe you could speak to that, sir, um, and maybe provide clarity on how um, stakeholders can reach out. The second question refers to uh, terrorist financing, money laundering screening done by the NFIU. Um, someone says, how long does it take to get feedback on the screening and the rendering of feedback to the CBN um, to enable crediting of target or recipients um, local DOM accounts by local banks. Similar to that, someone is asking, is the NFIU obligated to inform the domiciliary account holder 
um, on the reasons for placing funds on hold by the CBN uh, due to the screening process and how long will these funds be kept on hold? So it's similar um, to the initial question. Um, so, and the last question here is, uh, what are the measures that um, a young tech company who's venturing um, as um, a new company or new venture, uh, what are the key measures, AML, CFT measures that should be borne in mind uh, by this type of entrepreneur? Um, so, sir, I, I hope you got all the questions. Wow, they, they, there's so many more, but I think you should answer those ones first <laughs> so that we don't lose track. Yes, I will try to also answer fast and speak directly to the questions. On the communication challenges, I first we have an email that is accessible and that is up and running 24-7. That's info at nfiu.gov.ng. Info at nfiu.gov.ng. It's up and running 24-7. We can be reached on that. That is okay. for communication. I am not going to give a timeline for response because it depends on the nature of the communication. If you expect us to, if the communication, if your communication is what we are going to get to third parties, it might not be as fast as you may want. On the second one, screen of tier four, by NFIU, tier funds by NFIU. Well, I don't, uh, I don't understand what you mean by screening of tier funds. What I know is that capitals, all funds that come into Nigeria, NFIU has to analyze and know the source. All funds that come from outside, the country, all offshore funds coming into Nigeria, just as we are talking about the ICRG process and the jurisdiction of high risk. So we need to know where it is the source and ultimately the, the use is going to be put to in Nigeria. And I know that for this, NFI works directly with the CBN and not with individual banks. So it depends on also on the case by case basis. NFI does not deal with individuals and cannot tell you that this is how long it took us. However, NFI is not obligated to inform the account holder because we don't deal with account holders. We, we conduct our analysis anonymously and render our reports to the supervisory authority as I had already said. We deal with competent authorities, law enforcement, intelligence security organizations and not individuals or financial institutions. So we are not obligated to inform the account holder that we are conducting analysis on the funds. A key MSCFT measures for young tech coming up, the measures first is CDD, then they are need, you need to know your customers. You need to know your customers also. You need to also screen your the pets. You don't allow, uh, uh, and you put in place internal mechanisms to be able to dis detect illicit funds. But also it depends on what uh, a sector of tech the company is going into. If it is not an, a, a company that you're going to deal with funds, Cash, basically, it requires uh, uh, minimal measures. We, 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 we ask for enhanced measures for companies that are going to be dealing with funds, especially cash. Thank you. All right, uh, uh, thank you very much. We have more questions. <laughs> um, so uh, the question 
again is with respect to engagement with the NFIU. Uh, someone is saying it's difficult to register a company with the NFIU. The system only allows a file size of just 3 MB. No matter how the PDF file is compressed, it may not always be less than that. Could um, the size limit be increased? Um, and then the second question is um, clarity. Uh, I, I will answer that question. The second question that is relevant is what's the position with approval for complete change of name by the NFIU with respect to change of BVN name? Um, so sir, could you address those questions? And then the last is asking for your email and the presentation. Is it my personal email or the email I just gave? Well, I believe it's your personal email because the email you just gave <laughs> is let's, let's general. Let's start from that the question from Max Ikombe. Max, good afternoon. Um, on the BBN change, we are working on it. It's not easy. I can tell you it is not easy because if you know the, the size of the banking public and the size of those that want to change some aspect of their BVN details. You understand it is not going to be easy. And then you also know that because of these preventive measures we are talking about to prevent fraud, to prevent the chain being used to perpetrate fraud, we are required to be a bit, a bit detailed. So we are, we, are, we are working on the ones we have now, which is much. And you, you also know that FIU is in Abuja. Nigeria has 30. The banking in Nigeria is spread all over the states of the Federation. Customers from even your village, when they want to change their details, they con the bank will contact the FIU. So it is, the, 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 the number is outrageous, but we are working on, on it. And very soon, very soon, we will we'll reduce it to a, 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 a manageable size. So, and for all those who have applied for BVN change and are experiencing one difficulty or the other, I apologize, but very soon it will be a turn of the past. On the difficulty in registration of companies on our portal, that is companies that are dealing with, uh, not registration with SCUMO, because we are not the ones registering for SCUMO. We need to differentiate between these two registrations. The registration on our government portal, it's, it's a technical matter. But I will refer it to our technical department. Once we are done today, I will let them know about the difficulty you're experiencing, especially with the size of the documents you want to upload so that they will do the need for. But I assure you that we have um, competent people in our IT team that will resolve it, whatever it takes. Thank you. And for my personal email, ah, official email is fobiamalo at nfiu.gov.ng. fobiamalo at nfiu.gov.ng. All small letters. All right, then. Thank you so much, sir. We actually have run out of time. I see Ms. Gina Wood is back in the okay. room and she has been responding to questions. This, I would um, like her to respond to this question dealing with uh, whether law firms are mandated to get school Well, certification. maybe I should, in the interest of time, uh, maybe I should, in the interest of time, just close on that point. I had mentioned it at the beginning of uh, the discussion that um, there is a declared position by the MBA um, and uh, the rules of professional conduct, which were released and come into effect in January 2024, richly provide uh, for anti-money laundering provisions um, in line with some of the thresholds that Ms. Gina Wood spoke about. So uh, maybe it would be better for us not to go into the controversial points and let's just um, stick with the position of um, our mother body, uh, which is still under consideration. So uh, the MBA president has uh, 
replete times uh, stated this uh, position, um, even in engagements uh, with the NFIU. And the clear position is that there is currently no application to be registered with SCOMO, right? Because uh, the MBA is a self-regulatory organization. Um, if you have any questions regarding that, maybe uh, you seek and you would like additional perspectives. Um, I'm sure Mr. Popiamalu and hopefully Ms. Wood would also be able to, um, uh, on a separate basis, provide clarification. I think that it's a good place to stop. We're 20 minutes over the time, uh, three o'clock. Um, I believe it's been an engaging session. Uh, Mr. Biamalu, just to confirm that we can share your presentation um, with uh, attendees. Yes, uh, please, feel who free to do that. All right, then, thank you. Um, I don't know if Ms. Gina Wood is in the room um, and wants to just uh, give closing remarks. Uh, key points uh, of what we've learned today, is, um, I will summarize in a few minutes. Um, so that just in case you missed any part, at least you can remember uh, key material points that can help with further research and learning development. But before I go into that, Ms. Gina Wood, are you here now? Okay, I don't see her. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Obiamalu. It's been a very enriching um, discussion. Thank you for all the effort uh, made in also sending a presentation and discussing it at length with us. Um, certainly, uh, there is necessary action uh, by the legal profession and lawyers in general in supporting Nigeria's AML CFT strategy, um, especially because we are at risk uh, of further degradation on the um, financial action task force rating scheme. Right now we're gray listed. If we do not uh, comply with the 15 actions that have been recommended over the next two years, we are at risk of being blacklisted along with Iran, uh, Myanmar, and um, uh, is it North Korea? Um, and so that and that's that's a, a a very 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 risky position, especially because we are chasing um, foreign direct investment as a lifeline uh, for our economic growth. So as lawyers, we are gatekeepers. We are required to comply with this AML considerations. Um, luckily, per the recommendations and the assessment by our speakers today, the um, RPC uh, provides us an initial landing point on compliance. And so maybe one of the things that we all can take away as an assignment is to review uh, the provisions of chapter two um, of the rules of professional conduct which provide guidelines on anti-money laundry um, actions by uh, and compliance by lawyers. Uh, the risk assessments were required to do enhanced due diligence provisions. The uh, the um, structure for uh, client um, review, know your customer uh, reviews to be conducted on clients at the point of onboarding, so that we can indeed be gatekeepers who are supporting um, the enforcement and compliance of these anti-money laundering provisions. Uh, if you have any questions, you wanna reach out to any of the speakers, please um, reach out to the SBL via our secretariat and I'm sure uh, you'll be put in touch with whoever it is that you would like to reach out. Uh, the NFIU's email address is info at nfiu.gov.ng. Uh, gracefully, Mr. Biamalu also shared his email F or Biamalu at nfiu.gov.ng. Um, and with this, we've come to the end of the session. Thank you everyone for joining um, and see you at the next episode. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Miss Wood. Bye-bye.